Hello and welcome once again to episode 57 of Code Completion. We are a group of iOS developers and educators hoping to share what we love most about development, Apple technology, and completing your code. My name is Dimitri and I'll be your host once again for this episode and I'm joined today by my fellow completionists, Fernando. Hello, hello. And Spencer. Hey there. So before we get into our main topic, it's time for our Indie App Spotlight. Today we're, we are checking out Command Tab Plus by Garasim Sergi a Mac utility app that replaces Command Tab. So Command Tab Plus extends the basic functionality of the app switcher by adding the ability to see windows for a given app, only show active apps, or those that are in use on a given space or display. Uh, better yet, Command Tab Plus can be completely customized with different skins and hotkeys. Um, so it's like a really great option if you want to customize your Mac further. Uh, Command Tab Plus is free to try and costs only $10.49 for standard license for version two, or $34.99 for a lifetime license that you can get uh, versions 3, 4, 5, 6, et cetera, uh, with access to all future versions. So please be sure to support Garrison and check it out today. And if you are an indie app developer, we want to hear from you. Please reach out to us on Twitter at Code Completion via DM so we can spotlight your app in the future as well. So sometimes we take for granted as software developers, um, like filing bugs, Sometimes it's easy, sometimes it's hard. We don't really think too much about it, but a lot of our listeners might not have filed tons of bugs in the past, uh, like the hundreds of radars that Fernando has filed. Um, so we figured we might go over uh, what makes a good bug report. Spencer, so why did you go first? <laughs> <laughs> I knew that was coming. Uh... Well, I definitely have the least amount of experience here. Um, I'd say making sure that you can reproduce the, the bug and making sure that it's something that is not like user error in the sense of it's something that you've done wrong, but it's actually an issue with uh, the SDK or whatever you're using and making sure that you can kind of write some good steps to uh, reproduce the error. And also I know that including like an example project with um, with uh, maybe just showing that error so they could just run the project or have a, an easy starting point to um, go off of would, would be helpful, at least kind of in my eyes. Yeah, so having those clear reproducible steps uh, that from a very limited like scenario, you're not trying to do everything under the sun, uh, can reproduce the issue and verifying that the issue is indeed not in what you're doing wrong, but in whatever the code that you're using is supposed to do uh, to make sure that that is doing it correctly, right? Mm -hmm. The ultimate goal of a really good bug report is to give the developer no room for escape. That's it. Because if you do, <laughs> if you write a good bug report, they can't say like, oh, it's not happening on my machine. It's not this, it's not that. They're just like, they have to admit that, okay, yeah, I see this. I'll fix it. Because it's, it's just fun. Uh, a fun thing to see a developer squirm. Me being a developer, <laughs> of course. <laughs> yeah, and anything you can you can do to, to support your theory as to why... Uh, not your theory, your hypothesis as mm -hmm. to why a bug might be happening. Like uh, logs, um, screenshots, uh, sample project, like Spencer said. Uh, all of those become super useful to the people like fixing it on the other side. Um, and they're going to increase your chances really of it getting fixed. Um, like you do have to remember that when you do submit a bug report, it's at the mercy of someone else like spending time and actually fixing it. Yeah. Um, and yes, sometimes you are a paying customer and they need to go ahead and fix something that is broken for you to continue paying them. Um, but sometimes you are not and you're using something for free and stuff like that. So, uh, you should at the bare minimum in any scenario, be respectful of the person on the other end of your bug report, right? Don't, don't be mean to them because that's just going to decrease <laughs> the chances whether you're a paying customer or not, that's going to be fixed in a way that you will be happy with or not. Right. Agreed. Video evidence I found to be really, really good. Cause it's persuasive. Yeah. Again, as a developer, you can you can see a, a list of like uh, rep reproduction steps, and you'd be like, yeah, sure, whatever. But then if you see a video of like a quirk going on, it's like ah, sh like 
Okay, I can't <laughs> I can't bullshit my way out of this one, and I may mm-hmm. be re- uh, revealing too too many secrets, but uh, I don't. It's for the good of the uh, of the industry. <laughs> So a really common set of bug reports that you'll hear in the Apple ecosystem developer uh, space are something called radars. Um, so if you don't know, a radar is the or radar is the internal tracking tool that Apple uses for their own bug reports, um, and a bug uh, ticket is called a radar. So those words are used interchangeably. That said, us as as non Apple developers, we, like we we are Apple ecosystem developers, but we don't work at Apple. Uh, we don't have access to Radar itself, but we do have access to something called uh, Feedback Assistant, uh, which uh, assists Apple in providing feedback. Uh, <laughs> like, whoa, yeah, that's that's the that's the the hardcore naming that goes on with that product. Um, <laughs> yeah, for for whatever reason, Apple has like removed proper nouns from all their like software over time like iCal just became calendar um etc uh so feedback assistance is a generic way of providing feedback um and oftentimes you might hear people talk about like spin dumps and uh all these things that they need to prepare for a good uh feedback assistant ticket or radar and like there's still radars in the hood um so what is a spin dump I guess as like a, an opening into how to file good feedback assistant reports. It is a trash can, metaphorically speaking, that turns around again and again. A spin dump? Yes. No. Oh, I guess because it's a dump, and it's a, it's spinning. Oh, <laughs> I get it. <laughs> Gotcha. Sorry. I thought it was funny. That's fine. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, so... um, (laughs) Uh, I don't know. I don't either. Would that that have been easier? (laughs) So, spin dump uh, is a way of telling the kernel, so your operating system, of uh, dumping all the information that it currently has about your system um, into a file so that way you can provide that to Apple engineers and they can hopefully get some extra juicy bits of information out of uh, your problem. However, like these aren't necessary for all issues. Like if you have a graphical issue where like buttons are not aligned, you do not need a spin dump. Um, a spin dump is going to be super useful if your Wi-Fi is not working properly. Mm. Uh, that's going to have that extra bit of information that might explain that, oh, your Wi-Fi interface is currently turned off. That's why Wi-Fi is not working. Um, that kind of, uh, those kinds of details. Um, but a lot of, um, if you use Feedback Assistant, a nice thing is that it will start collecting spin dump automatically. Uh, the bad thing is if you're on a slower computer, this may take forever and cause your computer to grind to a, like a slow uh, stop. Um, so if you don't think you need a spin dump, so if you don't think Apple engineers need that extra information, you can always like stop it and it won't continue collecting that. Mm. Um, but if you don't know if you need it or not, you can always let it finish collecting that information. And the really nice thing is you can have it collect a spin dump on a device that is um, not your Mac, for instance. So you can have it collect one for a HomePod that's on your network. Um, And that's a great way of helping Apple engineers fix issues on devices that are not like what you're directly working with. Um, And that can be super useful. Is it named spin dump because of the uh, like the spinning wheel? Yeah, okay. basically. Neat. Um, I, m- I might be misremembering if they need spin dumps or if it's a uh, cis diagnose. Uh, let me create a new. Let me issue. crash my Mac. Rear back. <laughs> <laughs> uh, feedback from Mac OS. Cis uh, diagnose. Oops. Okay, so <laughs> I have no idea what I'm talking about this whole time. Um, <laughs> See, at least I was admitting it. Well, I wasn't. But so, okay. a spin dump is a specific thing, as you as you mentioned, Fernando, when you get the spinning wheel of death, the spinning mm-hmm. beach ball, as old-time Mac users used to call it, because it used to be two colors, black and white. Um, so whenever you get one of those, that means that your system is not able to, not your system, your that app 
uh, that's in the foreground is not able to process events for, I believe, two seconds. Um, and therefore, the system will detect that it's not dequeuing events and it's just going to tell you, hey, this thing is doing something. I have no idea what, though. Um, and the system will automatically collect a spin dump um, at that moment in time to kind of get extra information as to what the process is doing. Um, and those spin dumps are usually automatically collected by feedback assistant. But what most uh, feedback assistants um, tickets need is a SIS diagnose, uh, which will give you that kernel dump, uh, basically, um, where it will just kind of take everything that's in the kernel space and put it in a file so that way uh, that can help, hopefully. That said, it's a lot of information that is like private to your computer, so sometimes you don't want to include it. Yeah, that makes sense. So as far as, and I'm kind of just going off of what I've heard because this hasn't happened to me, but you know, when you file uh, a radar, you, you you know file a re report through like Feedback Assistant, for example, for, for Apple specifically. What do you expect on, on the other side as someone that's filing the report? Like what what happens or what I I suppose could happen in, in a few scenarios? What do you mean? I, like I I don't follow. Like. You know, you you file the report. What like what's the next step, or Wait. how long does it? Okay, right, yeah. So like I was gonna say, how long does it take for you to kind of get a response? And I, I'm sure it will vary from, uh, I don't know, maybe a few weeks to. I think Dimitri said that he has one that's been up for a decade now. Is that right? Uh, yeah. Let me let me go dig it up. I believe <laughs> it's since uh, 2010. March seventeenth, two thousand and ten. Um, that's my oldest. <laughs> that's yeah. my oldest feedback assistant. But that's not my oldest bug report. That's just the oldest one that got imported into feedback assistant. <laughs> so with that, I'll I'll often hear, and Dimitri even said it is, um, you know, will like, I, I don't know the exact terminology, but he said, you know, like, will you also file this or file this again? basically re like duplicating the the feedback so that it sort of puts another tick on um for for apple to see like oh more than one person is seeing this right mm -hmm. yeah that's that's called well so the issue is that internally i'm sure apple gets like hundreds or thousands of, of bug reports like a month and mm -hmm. those obviously go into like a sort of backlog and since we haven't invented like uh, GitHub already tried, but we haven't invented code that codes itself, uh, we have a limited <laughs> amount of, of human resources, and that are competing with like features and whatnot. Like we we all know this, right? Yeah. Um, so the issue is that um, uh, what I've heard from Apple engineers is that the more people report a bug, the more likely it is to get fixed. And I think the the term for this, Dimitri. Uh, or, or Spencer, if you already know this, uh, you can correct me. It's duping a radar. Yep. Uh, short for duplicating, I guess, duplicating basically. instead of like cheating someone out of a radar, which right. would be fun. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, like like Dimitri has a, a bug that's ten years old. I have one that I reported in 2015, and I've gotten no response. So, right. Yeah. If it's a one-off, they're a lot less likely to do anything about it. I'm sure. And it may be mm -hmm. like very like unique and specific that it's really not worth fixing at all. I, mm -hmm. I think that's actually something important that we should we should talk a little bit about it. Um, when you find a bug, uh, usually your first incident as a developer is one: I should probably report this. Uh, two: If you have enough energy and you do report it, I'll try and follow it up in some way. Uh, but really, when you receive a bug report sometimes it's really not worth your time fixing something like it may be something so simple so unique that even looking into it doesn't even make sense uh, for example i i can share the the bug that i have opened for uh since uh 2015 it's really something like really dumb regarding the uh, cf uh, core foundation http messages i was trying to set two headers with the same name in an http message uh, with the same mm -hmm. title. So mm -hmm. in theory, if I set a header with the set uh, dash cookie name, uh, it shouldn't fold, like it, uh, Core Foundation shouldn't fold several headers with that set cookie name uh, into a single header. And it was, it is. To replace the previous one. 
Yeah, no, no, no. It shouldn't. It shouldn't replace it. Like you, you can have several. The according to the HTTP standard, you can have several yes. oh. using the same name, right? But I'm pretty sure Core Foundation is using the equivalent of a dictionary, and so if you set it, it just replaces um, one, right? But this is such a minor thing that I, I don't think anyone has it's out even... of spec, Fernando. <laughs> exactly. That's that's some famous words, and it goes back to what I was saying. Don't let developers like weasel their way out of bug reports because <laughs> it's like, oh, I don't have enough time for that. Um, but yeah, it, that's that's the summary of it. Sometimes bug reports are meant to be fixed, and sometimes they just are not. Mm -hmm. And something to consider too is that you or shouldn't feel like you're doing Apple's job. Um, like, don't spend hours and hours of your day unless it's very important to you that this thing gets fixed but most of the time you're going to end up finding a workaround anyway so whether it gets fixed or not you're never going to care um which is both like the unfortunate thing as to why things never get better uh but also uh the reality of like being able to do what you're doing is you can't rely on apple fixing something in two years you need the fix now uh so you're going to find a workaround whether you want it want to or not um, that's going to be adequate enough. Um, and it'll be nice if it gets fixed, but oftentimes that doesn't impact you anymore. Um, so anytime anyone tries to make the case that, oh, if you never follow radar, then it's never going to be fixed and you're like doing everyone a disservice, don't feel bad about that. Um, like you should not feel like you're doing Apple's job. You should feel like you're doing them a favor. Um, and if they don't care about your favor and it gets brushed under the rug, then that's how much they valued your favor. Like that's, that's all you should kind of see into it. But, uh, if it's an Apple engineer explicitly asks you, Hey, can you follow a report for this specifically? That means that they want to work on it, but they need that, um, not that push, but that mode, not that motivation either. Um, I, yeah, the word escapes me too. Uh, Basically, the only way they can motivate working on it from a business point of view is if there is a radar number that is backing it. Um, mm -hmm. So if you don't file it, they can't. They quite literally cannot spend time doing that and get a good evaluation at the end of the year that they've been like doing good uh, work for this or that. Like they need to have a ticket for everything that they're working on to motivate working on it. So if you can file a ticket because you were asked to directly by an engineer that's going to be working on it, then do provide one. Like they're trying to help you as much as possible at that point. So um, the, the right favors work both ways. Justification, I guess. Justification, so you need yes, a way exactly. to justify the time spent. Uh, however, I've had that happen not to, not to badmouth any engineers because I, I don't know any specific names. But I worked for VPNs a long time and it didn't matter that I did a report or that I did get a hold of, a, of an engineer and they told me, hey, please, please just report this. Sometimes things never get fixed, even if they want, like, even if you assume the engineer has the best intentions and they really want to work on it, uh, usually what happens, and we'll probably all face this at work, what happens is the engineer comes in with their brand new radar and tells their manager, hey, this, uh, like, someone came up to me at WWC and mentioned this, they filed a radar, I want to fix this, and their manager will say no. Like, there's more important things to do. So... Mm -hmm. Yeah, like Dimitri said, I really like uh, the way he, he mentioned it. Like, it's a favor you're doing to Apple. Uh, sure, it's going to be useful to you, but in the end, it's something they should be working on, and you're only there to help them out a little bit. Yeah, Apple has a giant team of QI, QA engineers that is always, hopefully, trying to make sure that uh, whatever they're doing is going to work in the way that they want it to, um and you they're not paying you so you yeah. don't need to feel the need that uh you need to help them every step of the way now as as we mentioned before you should always be courteous like in this process um because there's always a different another human being at the other end of it whether that's just the person screening it and maybe they miss screen and put in the wrong bucket and your bug never gets seen <laughs> at, again but they are most definitely like feel bad for them a little bit have some empathy uh it's most likely thankless work that they they are doing regardless 
Um, so be cognizant of that, I would say. Um, and that works doubly, not just for bug reports in uh, Feedback Assistant, but also uh, bug reports for like open source projects. Like a lot of times people will just go on GitHub and say, this doesn't work and be mad. Um, and that <laughs> yep. is like extremely unlikely that anyone is going to help you especially anyone that's like donating their free time to help maintain something um that is not the way to ask basically agreed yeah as no go for it uh yeah i, I was going to say it's yeah uh, open source is notoriously different from closed source in that sense like anyone can report any bug but getting it fixed like sometimes you gotta get your hands dirty um and sometimes I've, I've seen it. It's really, I don't think it's as bad as like social networks, but it is, it is relatively common for other developers to be like, well, like what kind of show are you running if this isn't fixed? It's, I've seen it a few times and it's very annoying. Yeah, I agree. I think kind of a cool thing though, is that you can, in those cases, get your hands dirty if, if you are able to, and you you have the kind of requisite knowledge, you could say, well, you know what, maybe I either I'm filing this issue or you just look at the issues and be like, oh, this is broken. Um, I Roll also up need your this. sleeves I, and I, yeah, jump in, right? <laughs> I could fix it and send in a pull request or whatever. And that's an option to get moving forward. And that would be, you know, beneficial, just not just for you, but also for other people. And you can kind of take it into your own hands and, uh, do it maybe on of course you're donating your own time but maybe that time gets you a solution quicker than relying on other people to to get that solution in uh again if you have the, that requisite knowledge so that's also an option and there's and there's a an, uh, follow-up even after that so even if you if you have the ability and the time to fix it like then the interesting question is uh should i uh, submit a pull request because it it's easy enough like and i've had it happen both ways where you're just like in a rush and the issue is like not important to everyone else but it is important mm. to you so you just fork the project fix the issue and that's it and it always uh, it, it's happened to me several times where you go well i'll open the pull request later and then you never do so <laughs> that's that's something in, in an, an additional step that um i at least would would like to be a little bit better um, about. Yeah, because going that extra mile to open the pull request means you also need to clean up your code. You oh, need to document right. what you added. You need to add tests if <laughs> the project requires it and is being well maintained. So there's a lot of extra work there, um, but also like just as demotivating as filing feedback assistant reports is sometimes you submit a pull request and no one looks at it and it just kind of sits there for 10 years in the GitHub totally. thing. Um, yeah. And that's that's unfortunate. Now, the nice thing about most open source projects is you can totally fork it publicly mm -hmm. and be the new steward of your fork of the project. Um, right. like that's the whole that's the whole motivation behind a lot of open source stuff is, hey, you can make modifications as long as you think the original authors too. like you can take it in your own direction if you'd like. Um, that is totally on the table. Um, so that is an avenue if you find yourself fixing things uh, that were useful to you and maybe the original author didn't find that it aligned with their interests, but there are definitely others that might find it aligns with my like, years, right? I, I agree 100%. And a small tangent there, you mentioned like you can fork it um, in, in an open setting. Uh, mm -hmm. How do you say that? Publicly. Yeah, publicly. You you just fork it publicly. You can fork it uh, privately. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, yeah, privately. I would say um, if you like, if you feel like a project isn't going the right direction and you want to use it privately, you can certainly do that most of the time, depending on the license. Um, a funny anecdote: I saw uh, Brent Simmons, uh, which now works at Amazon, and he's the uh, I, I I would say the steward of um, Net Newswire. Um, he was actually taken aback when NetNews Wired appeared on the App Store as a paid app by some random person. And he was like, no, this isn't the uh, the spirit of open source, uh, blah, blah, blah. 
I found it really funny because uh, the Net News Wire is uh, licensed under the MIT license, which allows you to do basically anything to the code. Like the MIT license is a very permissive license that allows you to modify the code, take it, sell it, uh, do do whatever you want with it. So. Uh, it's also important when you're contributing to open source, when you're deciding to fix a bug or a fork or the repo or whatever, it's important for you to remember that you need to check the license. Uh, if you're fine with just giving away that code and having people just use it, that's great. If you're not, then just be careful. Uh, I haven't had this, well, actually, yeah. Um, a few companies I've worked for basically take um, auth uh, ownership of whatever code you build while at work. I don't know how that works if you contribute to open source while uh, in, in an official capacity, but that's also another thing that you need to be aware of while contributing um, code to an open source project. Yeah, yeah and it's, it's important to also remember that a code license is not necessarily a product license. Uh, like That's Net right. Newswire, the name uh, may be a very different thing. So yes, you can copy all the code into a different app that you name yourself. It's your own product. That mm -hmm. would have probably been more in line with the spirit of open source, um, where you can kind of like share it in that way. Um, but you are absolutely right, Fernando. It is up to the author to explicitly say, hey, you can use it for anything you want, but you cannot do this. You cannot do that. Um, and, uh, that said, a lot of people are never going to read your license, nor is it never going to apply directly to them, uh, because they live in a country where your license means literally squat. Um, so like, that's a thing that you need to realize, like once you make something available, someone will steal it, uh, regardless. Um, but also again, if you are putting something on, uh, GitHub, one way to prevent someone from making a paid version of it is to make a free version of it or a paid version if you want to help support your own development, I mean, it's your app, um, on on the App Store and explicitly take up that slot, right? Don't let someone else kind of take it for you. You know what would be really cool? I know GitHub has started offering like sponsorships for open source projects. Mm -hmm. It would be really cool if uh, you could set up a sponsorship for an open source project and then have, have GitHub like basically like have a system in github that that sets rewards for bugs as a monetary uh thing that would be fun and interesting right so if you donate a hundred dollars you can like the the steward uh, of the project and say hey this bug is worth twenty dollars this bug is worth fifty dollars because i think that would be i like money so <laughs> 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 it's kind of an interesting concept that's cool just if you have time just get a quick twenty dollars for fixing a bug or whatever i think that would be great like you could you could make a living as an open source bug fixer that would be interesting i wonder how many people would actually do it and like try to make a decent amount of money off of that just by bug hunting i mean if you I mean, set it's your kind of price at $20 is going to not be very successful. Yeah. Like <laughs> no, I know. For sure. Not only do you have to learn the project, you have to get comfortable with it and then spend totally. less than like two minutes uh, to fix the bug. It's like, yeah, $20. Okay. Definitely. What about like get thousand crypto sure. coins? Oh, I was just going to say, yeah, <laughs> they could start doing a crypto or something. Get yeah. your code NFCs. Oh, yeah. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> I'm selling my .h file. Anyone interested? <laughs> <laughs> That's great. You could be the sole owner of this .h file. Oh, yay. I you swear, can include I... it in all the things that you need. <laughs> <laughs> Completely swear, unrelated. If we, if, if we did like an NFT for like iOS code, we, we'd be rich in no time. Oh, we'd no. also be partly responsible for burning down the planet. But <laughs> we digress. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Have you kind of on the, uh, a similar topic to what we're talking about with licenses? Did you guys see the, um, the stuff with OBS this week and what happened with OBS? Streamlabs, and, uh, right? Streamlabs. Yeah. Kind of, yes. kind of the same thing. Really? Yeah, Streamlabs was using the Streamlabs OBS. So SL OBS slobs. 
I, I think they uh, <laughs> yeah. their marketing uh, team hit it out of the park with that one. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah. So they have slobs, and OBS was basically pissed uh, that they were using their name um, and making a product that had uh, actively just a straight damaged. Forward. Yeah, and it was actively damaging their reputation in the process. Mm-hmm. Um, so that is a hundred percent something that OBS is entitled to fight for. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's kind of unfortunate because Streamlabs is a company and OBS is not necessarily one. It's just a bunch of contributors working together to make, uh, software that works for them. So it's, it's hard to win those battles. I would say. Yeah, like you guys remember the left pad incident on, on the JavaScript world. Mm hmm. Uh, got, for, for those it got of you that included don't know, in like millions of packages, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, for those of you that don't know, uh, there's a uh, like a shared repository, sort of like a CocoaPods equivalent in JavaScript called npm, um, and npm just holds a bunch of different libraries and so on. And then one day, uh, I think a, a year or two ago, uh, a ton of projects just stopped working, um, and people traced down the issue to a single project called LeftPad. That I think basically added a couple of bits on the left. I don't. I don't even remember what the. It was such a simple thing. Someone it, fixed the bug. <laughs> yeah, yeah, something it like that. It wasn't padding correctly. But yeah, it was something like a three-line project uh, packet package for. Ev- but everyone was using it. Everyone, and so Ooh. the internet basically came down. Uh, and this, uh, the the owner of the left pad um, package was. Um, he was angry at something or someone and he basically said, you know what, this is my package. I'm going to take it with me. And he took it down and NPM basically said, uh, the internet depends on us and they restored the package. And the guy was, was, I think very angry. Like he, he was right to be angry because it was his code. But then all I'm trying to say, I think I'm ranting a little bit. All I'm trying to say is that licensing is very difficult, especially if you go through some third party like GitHub. GitHub is nice and all. We use it a lot, but it's Microsoft um, and it's a centralized uh, monolith. So we, you got to be careful of where your code ends up. So as a final topic, um, going a little bit backwards back to Feedback Assistant, um, over the past few weeks and continuing for a few more, um, Apple has been hosting kind of WWDC in uh, winter. Um, so these are called Tech Talks, and they are a bunch of uh, either sessions where they spend 30 minutes like going over uh, a topic or stuff that has changed since the presentations at WWDC during the beta period. And then the next 30 minutes to an hour um, is a Q&A where you can go ahead and ask questions um, and so forth. So that's one half of the tech talks. The other half are what they call office hours. And these are basically labs um, as we have come to uh, be comfortable with them over in um, these remote times where you kind of log in via WebEx and you can talk with the Apple engineers that way. Um, now, these labs are a great place to bring up your radar numbers if you do have them or your feedback assistant numbers. And Doing so in that situation is much more likely for you to be able to, as Fernando said, get an engineer your specific problem and let them go to their manager and say like, hey, you were on this call with me. You heard them <laughs> uh, go ahead and complain that this was not working for them. And they provided this this feedback assistant number and they make a great case for it. Um, and even though they are the only ones that need this, we can see multiple people being able to use this as well. So, um, I just wanted to bring up that the tech talks are still a thing, uh, that is happening over the months of November and December. Mm -hmm. Um, so if you get a chance, definitely take advantage of them. Um, I've been listening in on a lot of not the office hour ones, but just the streamed ones. And they most definitely will be able to get to your questions that you ask via Q and a. Um, if you ask them early enough. So uh, highly, highly recommended in general if you uh, do any sort of Apple development uh, to take part in this because it's completely free and Apple is giving their time uh, to help us in ways that they don't typically do. So um, definitely something to take advantage of. Do you know if they're being recorded? They are not. They're not, right? Yeah. Mm-mm. 
that's that's really important to uh to note because i was hoping uh to review some of them but then uh, i realized they're not yeah they have digests but it's just kind of going over what was briefly talked about and I think if you if you want to join, all you have to do is just go to the developer page and register, and then they send yep. you a link. Is that right? Uh, yeah. So they don't send they send you a link to join the WebEx, um, but there's a whole schedule. A lot of them fill up, but they add new ones every Monday. So cool. by the time this comes out, it will already have happened, but there might still be some available. And then the following Monday, they might add more. Nice. Nice. Um, I think I had one more thing that I want to bring up. Let me try to remember. And as a very final uh, talk about bug reports, when you are on the other side of a bug report, it's very tempting to blindly follow what is requested and say, oh, the customer needs this in this spot. So I'm just going to do exactly that. I'm going to put a button where they asked me to put a button uh, and uh, done solved bug fix and then move on to the next customer's request and put a button over there and over here and over there <laughs> um and this is a great way for feature creep to kind of invade your application right and i would suggest that if you are a developer on the other side of bug reports to take whatever's coming in as a suggestion and if you have the opportunity to have a back and forth, identify the problem that the customer is trying to solve rather than the solution that they provide you with. Because there are oftentimes many solutions to the same problem. And some solutions are a little more adaptive towards many problems, whereas others kind of just focus on that one problem and will only fix that one problem. So. Uh, as a developer and as a product designer, because ultimately you're building something, um, definitely think about what someone is suggesting rather over what their actual problem is um, and try to identify what that problem is because it's going to be tremendously useful in solving those simpler bug reports. Like, oh yeah, I could do that in an afternoon. Uh, it's not really a bug per se that is like undetected by me. Um, and it's, it's something that can be actively worked on by anyone really try to think about how to implement that in a way that is not going to impact your software for everyone else in a negative way. Right. I agree a hundred percent. Uh, it's, uh, this, this goes back a little bit to bugs that shouldn't be fixed. I, I guess there's a spectrum between you fix it doing exactly what, what's requested and you don't fix it. There's a lot of great areas there, um, especially like you mentioned, where you have to be very cognizant of what you're trying to fix. Uh, otherwise, you end up with like bad bug fixes or feature group. Yeah, and I think just because someone gives you, uh, you know, either files an issue or, uh, you know, whatever you want to call it, feedback or whatever, it's it's just that it's it's feedback. And so just because it's a user saying, hey, I need this, it's like, do they know best, right? And maybe, I don't think we as developers always know best, but I think in general, we probably know if we are among the targeted audience for the app, we probably have a good idea of what is good and what is not. Um, and it's it's always awesome to get um, feedback and advice from users of how the app could improve, but definitely don't just <laughs> blindly say, oh, because they... They want a button here or they want this i should do it it's like does it make sense in general for the app as a whole just mm -hmm. just like dimitri and fernando said i agree just just a tiny correction um i've been doing this so long that i actually do know what's best ah that's right that's right i'm sorry well <laughs> for us that haven't got to that level of of godhood yet uh, you will we, you will we've... spencer you're very oh, okay cool he's a okay, level awesome. nine developer we talked about this. exactly oh that's true <laughs> Uh, there was a funny Almost. tweet by um, Ting, uh, I think Ting Beckers, uh, her last name. Well, she's she's quite a celebrity, one of the organizers for um, the iOS Dev Happy Hour, where she tweeted like, oh, I've been debugging this thing for like three hours and then I realized I forgot to add the view as a sub view. Mm -hmm. And that never stops happening. Like you, oh, yeah. don't, don't believe me, I never know best. <laughs> yeah, well, definitely. Well, one step down from knowing best is knowing what the future plans of your app are. 
uh, which customers most definitely do not know. Do not. So, I agree. Uh, you you can definitely c- assemble all the other bug reports and wh- where you want to take the app, and sometimes it just doesn't fit in with the app that the user wants, and it's unfortunate, but they could potentially find another solution that does it in the way that they want um, that's not going to impact like how you are writing your app, right? You're not beholden to every single one of your customers. Um, exactly. Anything else? Sorry, didn't mean to cut you off. No, that was perfect. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Next topic. <laughs> Shut up. Um, <laughs> okay. Cut all that out. Um, <laughs> or will I? No, just leave it. So this week's episode of Code Completion is once again sponsored by Fernando's new book. Fernando, take it away. No. Thank you, Fernando. <laughs> Moving on. That would be so cool. So you got to leave the previous section and then this one. And then listeners will be like, what the hell are these guys doing? <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, sorry. Uh, okay, can I just go for it? Yeah. Okay, so yeah, thank you. I'm very happy to uh, to sponsor Code Completion. Um, I recently finished writing a book um, that basically goes into the basics of work as a developer just uh i i found out that uh some of my mentees got into work and they were surprised by a lot of like tiny details like uh over communicating right you you practice a lot your if you if you practice your lead code if you practice your tech skills on swift ui or ui kit you keep doing that but then you get to work and then you have a slack and then is it okay if I say this here in this channel? Should I be saying this privately? Uh, how do I introduce myself? How do I bring up an issue? So things like that, uh, things like uh, checking your own code, how to have a critical eye, and then uh, understanding what others are looking for in your code. All of those tiny details you don't get to learn when you're developing on your own because you're on your own, right? There's not a team going through your code. So I wrote a book, there's a bunch of things. Uh, it's mostly not technical in nature. It just goes over a ton of these tips uh, and, and interesting tidbits. And so if you're interested in it, uh, Dimitri will have the link below. And uh, it's on my Gumroad page, which I don't have at the moment. I'm the worst sponsor yet. But uh, yeah, please, uh, every, every dollar counts. Uh, I really need dollars to make myself feel good. So I would appreciate everyone, uh, every one of those sales. Thanks a lot. Not to mention it's good content. It, it is just... it is good content. I am not scamming you. I think it's good. <laughs> good. <laughs> it's 20,000 words. It's it's a lot of words. So thank you, Fernando, for sponsoring our show. Uh, please, I'll definitely post the link down below after Fernando one day gives it to me. Uh, and you can definitely go download it and give it a read. So now that we've gone through our topic, it's time for Complete the Code, where we quiz our listeners on your knowledge of Swift, Apple, and all things development. Spencer? Yeah, so uh, Dimitri actually posted the question to Twitter, but we haven't got any uh, responses yet. So we'll go over it one more time, uh, the one that we've been looking at for the last couple of weeks. Um, If you're listening to the podcast, you can always check the podcast art or the show notes to follow along here. Um, So here we have an async method. Um, that loads an image and loads metadata separately and then ultimately presenting them as a single unit. So how can you make sure that both load methods run concurrently? Thank you, Spencer. So if you think you can complete the code, tweet your answers to us with hashtag complete the code, all one word. The first to get it right will get a shout out uh, once we receive a response. (laughs) So uh, as we mentioned uh, last week, I said I might get another Thunderbolt uh, doc in the mail, and I totally did. So if you're watching the video version on YouTube, so if you didn't know, we have a YouTube channel for code completion, and this is where you can see our beautiful faces if you don't want to listen to our uh, screechy voices. Just put um, it on mute. So, <laughs> <just> on mute. <laughs> uh, so I did receive uh, the Thunderbolt doc. Um, so this uh dock is the one that gives you more thunderbolt 4 ports um so i were to make noise and take it out of the package uh on one side you have the thunderbolt um connection that goes to your computer and it will give you an sd card a usb 2 a headphone jack 
And then on the other side, you get three brand new Thunderbolt ports nice. uh, that you can connect to other Thunderbolt devices. You have power nice. for the whole thing, uh, Ethernet, and then USB 3. Um, I think, uh, yeah, all 10 gigabit per second ports. Uh, so you get three of those. Um, so four total USB A ports, three of them being the fast ones, uh, and then three extra USB 4 ports, uh, which are also Thunderbolt 4 ports. Uh, gigabit ethernet and then sd card slot and headphones um so if you have a brand new macbook pro um or any m1 mac or any thunderbolt 3 mac actually uh this is compatible with all of them and gives you a ton of extra options um and do note that on the m1 varieties you're still limited in the m number of displays that the system supports so this doesn't magically let you uh, plug in more displays, but you can put this in between uh, your displays. So I tested this out by putting in between my 5K uh, LG display and my computer, and it worked just fine. So nice. um, uh, I unfortunately pre-ordered this one first and then received the CalJigit one that we reviewed uh, last week. Uh, one, uh, like I received that one earlier, so <laughs> I'm currently using that one. Uh, but I'll probably switch to using this one because the Ethernet seems... Uh, handy mm -hmm. to have uh, and then I will go ahead and let Lynn use the other ones because then she can get lots of USB USB ports USB ports are super nice. nice and yeah and normal USB ports until we get to a future where we're all using USB-C which is I think going to be a hot minute still uh, we're getting there but we're getting it's there gonna be, yeah, it'll I'd... still be a few years I definitely replace a ton of my cables with USB-C cables, but the problem is mm -hmm. you could never add more USB-C ports to your Mac, right? Oh, yes. Once once you use the two that were available, that was it. Uh, and that was a super bummer. But now it's nice to see expensive uh, hubs start coming out. Um, so maybe in the future there will be cheap hubs. And I think once we have cheap USB-C hubs that just give you more USB-C ports, that's going to be when... Um, we'll see like USB A start dropping off uh, because ultimately it's just changing cables for yep. the most part. It's right. not really the device that changes. Yeah. So great. With all that out of the way, it's time for compiler error. Uh, my favorite segment where I get to test my fellow completionist <clears throat> knowledge about Swift, Apple, and all things development. You can see uh, Spencer in the left corner getting ready. Uh, and stretching before uh, the endeavor. So uh, let's get started. So we have a theme for today, and that theme is Apple Radar. Uh, so since we were talking about that, I figured it's the perfect uh, topic. So let's go through these one by one. Uh, statement number one, the internal Apple Radar app for iOS comes with a sticker pack for iMessage, allowing Apple engineers to communicate bug statuses in style. Statement number two, the mascot for Apple Radar is a purple anteater named Fixie, so inspired because the engineer's daughter was doing a report on them at the time. Statement number three, although the full app was never available to the public, a separate tool called Bug Reporter could be used to file radars, though it was made unavailable in 2019. And statement number four, it wasn't until after the iPhone was released that Tim Burks decided to create Open Radar in 2008 to make sharing and duplicating radars easier for developers. So, Fernando, as our resident expert uh, with six years of radar uh, experience waiting under your experience. belt. <laughs> six years of waiting experience. Why don't you go first? Uh, I, I, I believe number three, uh, a separate tool called Bug Reporter, um, that sounds that sounds plausible. I remember a new app coming out a few years ago, um, and I don't think that was feedback assistant. Uh, the mascot I like. I want to believe it is true because ants are <laughs> bugs, and an ant eater would just be like brilliant. So I love that one. I want to I want to say that one's true. Uh, open radar. That sounds vaguely familiar. That it would come out around two thousand eight. Um, that's around the time I started coding uh, on in on Objective C, so I would have been already like reading through the news. Um, honestly, I think that the one that that I just cannot believe is number one. I think that would have leaked in some way. 
Uh, or if it was public, it would have been like huge news. So I'm going to go with number one. Okay. And Spencer, you're up next. Yeah, I think I'm also going to go with number one. It just feels very weird that like a bunch of developers would be using sticker packs to communicate things. Whereas I think they just have some more uh, mundane system for uh, communicating bug statuses. I don't really think anyone would take the time to use a sticker pack, honestly. <laughs> Completely fair. And yet, wrong. Or what, what do I <laughs> yeah, say? Right. An, an equally excellent answer. Uh-huh. Um, yep, that's how okay. it goes. Okay, uh, so since you all agree with number four, let's start with that one. So it wasn't until after the iPhone was released that Tim Burks decided to create Open Radar in 2008 uh, to make sharing and duplicating radars easier for developers. Uh, so Open Radar is 100% a thing, uh, mm-hmm. and it was totally created by Tim Burks in 2008. So you're both right so far. Um, now, if you don't know, Open Radar is a website, openradar.appspot.com, I think. Um, where you can basically copy paste your radar mm-hmm. um, into a publicly searchable database that other developers can then go look up, say, hey, is my radar, uh, did someone else report something similar? Or you can go ahead and say, hey, can you duplicate my radar? It's over here in Open Radar. Um, so that is an option that's available to you as a third party dev. So moving on to number three, although the full app was never available to the public, a separate tool called Bug Reporter could be used to file radars, though it was made unavailable in 2019. So, Fernando, you mentioned that you seem to remember an app by this name, which I find curious mm-hmm. because Bug Reporter is not an app. It's a website, bugreporter.apple.com. Oh. Um, so that is a tool, and so this is still completely right. Um, and this was how you would file radars as a third-party developer. Um, and it was, to everyone's chagrin, uh, put made unavailable in 2019 because Feedback Assistant became the new thing uh, that you could go ahead and use. And Apple very graciously made apps for macOS uh, and for iOS. So if you're on macOS, if you open up Spotlight, you can just type Feedback Assistant and that'll just open right up. It's hidden deep in the system. And if you're on iOS, um, we'll probably post a link in the show notes, but you can go ahead and either type in a uh, URL, like just x dash feedback assistant colon slash slash, or maybe it's just feedback assistant colon slash slash. For whatever reason, on my phone, if I search feedback assistant, a shortcut opens up, uh, and that will just open up feedback assistant. So that's extra cool. Um, I don't know if I set that up or if it's just part <laughs> of the system. Uh, so I'm not going to say that's the way to do it, but if... Uh, you did set that up, then you can just search for in Spotlight. Or if you have a beta profile on your phone, then you just have the Feedback Assistant app um, that you can go ahead and use, and it'll collect cystiagnosis and stuff like that, um, as I mentioned. So this is also 100% correct, uh, which brings us to number two. So the mascot for Apple Radar is a purple anteater named Fixie, so inspired because the engineer's daughter was doing a report on them at the time. Uh, so... It is with deep sadness to have to report that you both are uh, incorrect because this is uh, the compiler error. No. It's not an anteater. It's an aardvark. And it has another name called Anika. Wait, aren't aardvarks anteaters? They are not. Um, (sighs) How I lived in a lie. Yeah. Uh, and it was inspired by a purple uh, plushie that the engineer had. Um, so there is a Twitter account, I think. Uh, I forget what it's called. Uh, Nika the Aardvark or something. Uh, and it's just that Aardvark plushie in different places around the world mm. as it travels. Uh, so that's super fun. Um, and yeah, Apple Radar has an official mascot. Wait, which brings us to number one. An Aardvark Wait, is an ant eater. It, eans, it is it not. It's a separate ant. thing. It, it may eat ants. So, yes, it, descriptively, <laughs> it is an anteater. But by the two other accounts, you are also wrong. So, no <laughs> weaseling yourself out of that one. That's okay, fair. that's fair. That's fair. That's fair. Um, which brings us to number one. Uh, the internal Apple Radar app apparently does have a sticker pack, and there are screenshots of this um, wow. online. Wow. Uh, so if you search for Apple Radar sticker pack, you'll get this. Um, there are stickers such as File a Radar. Um, there are other stickers <laughs> of uh, Anika, which is the 
the mascot uh, wearing an iPod or in the Apple bus, um, which if you work at Apple, that's the bus that takes you to commute to Apple. Um, there's another one for P1, which is the high priority uh, ticket. And then my personally favorite, uh, my personal favorite is the This Is Fine comic uh, with the little aardvark instead of the little dog. Nice. And that is that is Apple's internal bug reporter tool having a sticker pack, which I think is awesome. Uh, so better luck next time, both of you. Ah, we were so close. I I, I thought I that one was, was a between, slam dunk. Yeah, I was torn between one and two, but like. Yeah, look at the little Aww. ant eating at Aardvark. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where it went. As always, I want to personally thank everyone for listening in this week. Please be sure to follow us on Twitter at Code Completion to know when new episodes get released, and feel free to tweet at us if there's ever a topic you'd like for us to dig into. Most importantly, as a small podcast, please be sure to share this with your friends and family who are also interested in any part of the app development uh, process. It's your support that enables us to continue doing this. Uh, and if you want to help us duplicate our bugs from 2010, uh, let us know on Twitter and we'll be happy to send you screenshots <laughs> so you can dupe them. Um, so once again, I want to give my thanks to Fernando, who is at From Junior to Senior. That's F-R-O-M-J-R-T-O-S-R on Twitter. Spencer, who is at Spencer C. Curtis. That's S-P-E-N-C-E-R-C-C-U-R-T-I-S on Twitter for joining me this week. My name, once again, is Dimitri. You can find me at Dimitri Bunil. That's D-I-M-I-T-R-I-B-O-U-N-I-O-L. And we'll see you all next week. Bye. Bye. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one, one of the things that I was, uh, I was discussing with uh, Spencer and Dimitri before we well, at some point in time today, was about um, single-use functions. Um, I personally dislike single-use functions. And my boss uh, and myself has, have gotten into a, an interesting argument because he, he really likes them. Uh, he says they hide away complexity in a good way and they simplify um, reading code. And I feel completely opposite of that. Like... If if you want if you need to have a long function because it makes sense, you should write a long function. Like if it's 40, 50 lines, because it makes sense, then you should do it. Um, and so it's been uh, it's been funny. Uh, usually developers are uh, the developers I've worked with are are really good at at like being laissez faire, right? Just do whatever you need to do. Like you may like. Uh, curly braces uh, on new lines. I, I like them the other way. Just whatever. Either install a linter or just live and let live. But this is one of the topics where I feel very strongly about um, keeping functions uh, as multiple use functions. So yeah, I just wanted to share that with you guys. Like honestly, if a function is... Oh, my mic is like all over here. <laughs> If a function is um, only being called once and it's doing something, I think it's dangerous to turn it into a function and not just leave it be in line. Because if anyone adds to that or worse, starts depending on it and then not realizing that's being depended on in like multiple parts of the code and then adds to it and breaks some code but not other code, that's like the worst case scenario that Fernando has likely been burned by and that I have definitely been burned by. Um, and not burned by myself, but others have burned me um, by like pulling that kind of stuff, uh, refactoring into that kind of thing. Um, like you don't need a function to add two numbers, and yet that's the left pad that we're gonna see yes. over time and time again. <laughs> um, so, like, I am totally agreeing with you there. If there's like functionality that's happening in a function, uh, and it's only gonna ever be called once then that should just be in line and put comments around it. Um, That's it, yeah. Best part of Swift, you can make inline functions, like functions in functions. Oh, no, um, stop. <laughs> oh, no. Stop the madness, Dimitri. You're just hiding um, the one use function inside another function. Yeah, if you're not calling it again, there's no point. But sometimes you need to have it like refer to itself. And like weird callbacks oh, type of right. scenarios. Oh, right. I can see that. Um, yeah. So that's like a super easy thing. It's better to write a function that way than to like make a closure that you're saving into variables. There's like no point. Um, Swift will take care of it for you, which is super nice. Uh, and another super nice thing about Swift that works in the other 
person's camp uh, is it will go ahead and just inline your function, which is not yep. the case for Objective-C. Um, so performance-wise, there's no downside to making your one-use function separate. Uh, worse is when someone puts it in an extension and then you can't like find it anymore as I'm like with the code that calls it. Um, <sighs> and extra worse is when they don't mark it as private, which means that it's going to like obviously be used by places it shouldn't be used. Yeah. I have no comment. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> no further comment. I will say I have been throughout the years, uh, been bitten, uh, actually it, it, it's exactly like you've described it. This is one of the few things I haven't changed since I started coding professionally. Uh, but I've been burned by others who've done this. And it just, it increases the scope of variables if you need to share a variable between two functions. It just, uh, it it opens up a whole kind of worms in the, in the, uh, in the sake of uh, reducing complexity and increasing readability. I personally don't think it's true, but... Yeah, yeah, and there's that, no like file size limits anymore. Like you right. can just have a big file. Like right. there's no no downside to that. Like if if you have trouble reading 90 lines of code, then I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> we cannot work yeah. together. <laughs> it could be a code smell, right? It, it I, I won't say anything about the attributes of other developers, but if you feel uncomfortable reading that many lines, maybe there's something wrong. But the answer is almost never, or in my case, I would venture and say never. Uh, breaking it up into smaller one-use functions. So, yeah. So now that I've argued for you, Fernando, I have an argument against you, um, and that is uh, in SwiftUI, you have your body function, and your body function became becomes very quickly a staircase of death. I don't know what mm -hmm. people call mm -hmm. these when you have like nested upon nested doom. upon nested. Pyramids of doom, yeah. Pyramids of doom, doom. That's, that's the one. Uh, and something I find super useful is instead of making a new view per se, uh, for all the little subcomponents that you would then treat on their own individual thing, which oftentimes then you have to duplicate a bunch of bindings and state, and that can get hairy quickly making a property or a function that builds out that mm. tree. Um, like you're only going to call it once, but when you look at the body, it's very clear. You have the header, you have the... Uh, introduction, you have the main content, and then you have the footer, uh, or you have the scroll view, or the list, and then you have the cell. Um, like, those kinds of scenarios, like, yes, they're only being called once, they're only being used in one spot, but because it's its own little thing, it's almost a sub-view of your main view, um, and it makes the code more legible because you don't have a giant pyramid staircase of doom. Um, there's there's two so. interesting things here. The first one is that SwiftUI is very different. Uh, mm -hmm. the the conventions are up in the air still it's been it's been a few years but the conventions are up in the air so i i actually don't mind that and the second one is i feel that's different because of computed properties um yeah i have no issue with abstracting some of of the uh algorithm in a function in a long function into a computed property as long as you're like not needing to inject anything. If you can do that, then it makes sense, even if you use the property ones, right? The issues with functions, and I know like computer properties functions, it gets a little bit messy, but that's the subjective part of it. Even then, um, I feel semantics, like- Semantics, right? Yeah, it's semantics in the end. So I'll know it when I, when I see it, but what you're saying makes total sense to me. There's no need to create a new view if you can do a property and then just, do that, that I agree is likely to increase readability. Because again, and it's a view, right? It's not a logical, well, in Swift, yeah, that, that's what I'm saying. Bit, it's, yeah. it, you're not building out logic here, you're just building out a structure. And that's right. where the legibility is not impacted because you're not keeping in your head all the registers and like figuring out how the algorithm is working. Yep. Where once you break it up, then you have to assume that the other part is going to do what it's going to do, and you can no longer reason about that in a good way. Hmm. Agreed. I was I was thinking I was preparing for the worst when you said you had a question for me with the whole um, optional closure uh, with the default value of nil. But I think that's, <laughs> that's I don't have enough time for that one. So what you're telling me is computed properties in functions, those are okay, right? 
I had never thought of that. That's interesting. You can apparently have did sets. <laughs> it's a crazy <laughs> town. It's <spent. laughs> well, did sets are great. I love using did sets on IB mm-hmm. outlets. Uh, they're just fantastic. It keeps a lot of the logic in there instead of you did load. So I mean, can you have a computer property in a function? No. Can you? No. Can you? Because what's no. this crazy town? Wow. So, I've never thought about that. That's interesting. I'll think about it. Um, one of my Every students, time I try to use it, it was the wrong answer. Don't, <laughs> don't, don't fall for that trap. <laughs> one of my students, uh, Craig, uh, he had a, a really interesting pattern where it wasn't a, a computer property per se, but you would have like a, what do you call, uh, like self-calling closure? Mm-hmm. Yeah, like that for uh, complex properties inside a function. I found that interesting. Again, I think I tried it once or twice and it was the wrong answer, but it was an interesting pattern and I've, I've always kept it in mind. Mm-hmm. Okay. I mean, it's a great way of, of instead of like declaring your variable and then doing the logic and then setting yep. your variable, it's a great way of just having that be in line. Um, so I've, I've used that once or twice. Okay, thanks everyone. Bye. Bye.